Well, let's get into um, replication. This is uh, the last in a series of topics that we've been covering that um, have to do uh, primarily with you know, different ty ways or approaches of, of, get of getting something more out of existing types of systems. So transactions was something that we, start we, used, we, we, used, things, we used concepts that, that we learned already and we built up this interesting mechanism of a transaction. Um, there's some performance issues that we saw with transactions and so that you can use something like replication to address those. But I want to address, repli address replication, um, first of all, in a more broad context so we can see that it's a generally useful tool that has uh, some consequences. And then I want to get into it a little bit deeper into how you can apply that to transactions or distributed transactions to increase the performance there. Now that gets a little bit more hairy, a little bit more complicated, but you know, hey, that's what, that's what systems is about, is trying to make something that's very complicated a little bit simple, a little bit more simple. So what is replication? Well, it's a technique for increasing availability, fault tolerance, and sometimes performance. And replication can occur at many levels. You can replicate data, different copies of data. You can replicate computation. You can replicate communication. Uh, something like the, have you guys heard of these tandem machines, these fault tolerant machines? That, that they're these big machines where you can you know, take a sledgehammer to it and poke you know, a knife through it and supposedly it just keeps running and running and running. Um, well, there are these, there's these machines that are used, for example, by banks or, or when, you have, when you need systems that are extremely reliable. And these folks use replication all throughout this machine. They try to replicate everything so there's no, no place where there's a single point of failure. And in that case, it's an example of when you use all three instead of just using one. Uh, of course, when you start replicating, the natural consequence, and we've seen that this is actually a, a huge issue, um, is consistency. There's also coordination, which is a corollary issue. So once we start making copies, then we have to figure out, do we make them all seem like one all the time? Is that, and that's going to cost us. Or do we try to make it seem like, the, allow a little inconsistency? And depending on where you, where you are in that spectrum, it's going to depend on how you design that system and what, how the clients have to react to it. So here's some examples. Um, the atomic writes via, via file logging. We had, remember we had replication of the data. So we had the, the, the existing copy, then we wrote the new copy. So we had this and we put it on, on non-volatile storage. So by having these two different, two different copies of the same thing, we could guarantee that we could either roll back or go forward depending on where we were. Um, DNS versus Grapevine, great example of, of uh, different levels of how, where you want to set the trade-off, the consistency trade-off. Uh, and, you, and the scaling issues came out very nicely there. The RAID, here's, a, here's an interesting case because RAID, you do use replication for the reason, you, one of the reasons you want it in some of the RAID levels is purely for performance. So what's the trade-off there? The trade-off there is money, right? If you have all these, if you have these interleaved, bit interleaved RAIDs, um, you can get a lot more bandwidth out. You can, you can, uh, might even be able to reduce, um, the, uh, the latency if you have uh, the data replicated onto cache in the, on the front end, but it's going to cost you a bundle. Uh, and then AFS, and if you remember in AFS, you, could, you cache the whole file so the data was replicated, uh, and that's great because you get performance. You get better, um, you, you can have local reads and writes. Uh, you, have, you can have disconnected operation, which you'll read about in the CODA paper. Uh, but the problem there is that you can actually get into a really bad situation where the merge, when you come back in, is very inconsistent with a change that someone else made while you, while you were disconnected or while you had your own, your own version. So there's this versioning issue, which, which we talked about. The reason it's not as big of an issue there is because people assume that, that this will be very infrequent, so these big problems are not going to have to be dealt with uh, on a very, any kind of a frequent basis. So let's think about um, how we can use replication with, uh, for our transactions. Well, one of the things that we have to worry about is consistency, right? Because that was one of the reasons we were doing transactions to begin with, is because we want to make sure that all our states of any state that our system is in is going to be consistent. So that's why we need this atomicity, we need the recoverability and all of that. So now we're, we're actually pushing, to the, you know, pushing things to the limit of how do we get that, that consistency uh, and, uh, and to be assured, and what are the trade-offs we're going to have to make? How do we get around them? Well, 
the, the thing that you're, that you're aiming for is one copy semantics. So the semantics there is that when you access an object, it feels like it's, that there's one copy of it uh, from the transaction point of view. So the transaction isn't going to know that there's multiple copies sitting around. Um, the, uh, and that, if you do that, then what does that mean for your existing transaction code when you start replicating objects? Backwards compatibility. That's always a big, that's always a good goal because if you rewrite the way, this, the semantics for how you access objects, now all of a sudden your transactions have to, all have to be changed to take that into account if they can see that. So the one copy semantics assures some kind of backwards compatibility with your existing code. Uh, and again, our big, the big problem, if we had perfect conditions, if we had reliable, completely reliable networks, completely reliable servers, this might not be, replication for transactions might not be as big of an issue. But unfortunately, we have to deal with these two uh, issues. That's where the, the hairiness comes in. Questions so far? Okay. So I usually like to start by giving a simple model so that we can, you know, sort of the more, most intuitive thing you might synthesize and then start addressing some of the issues that come up in that. So imagine that what we did is to do this, we had a set of replicas for a given object. What we did is that we, what's called uh, read one, write all. So if you want to read, you can read from any one of these. And so wherever you are in the network, you can say, great, you know, I'm closer to over here. I can just go locally and everything. You know, you get these reads faster. Oh, that's cool because that's one of the reasons you're replicated. Now when you write, well, what do you want to do? If you write, if you send a write to this one, you want it to propagate over to all of them. Right? Because then that way, those, everyone will have a current copy. Now, in order to do that, what, what's the issue that you have to get around to make sure that, that you don't get an inconsistency here? You have to make sure that all of your, the places where you're writing actually get the information and make the change. That they, okay, so one is that they actually get the change. And what's the other one? Right, so in, you can't have this one writing to this and this one writing to this and then those colliding somewhere because then your transactions will, will fall apart. So what ends, what's a mecha, so what are you, what's the, what's the technique that we use, that we learn to get around that issue? Lock, locking or mutual exclusion. Right, so if you're doing a write, you, one, one straightforward way is to use what we learn how to do mutual exclusion or locking and just go through, lock all these guys up. If you can lock them all, then you can write to them. And then once everyone's updated, then you can say, okay, now everyone can access the system again. If, uh, if mm -hmm. someone wanted to read while the write had not been committed throughout the system, you may want to notify them that they have read something which has proved to be out of date. So if you want to do a read, with the, if you're going to be doing, it depends on the type of lock that you're doing. If you're reading something that's not going to impact, and not going to do a write, that's not going to impact uh, uh, something uh, it's not going to come back and impact someone else reading then you might want to just have a read lock on it i'm sorry a, uh, a read a read a read only lock on it um, if you have you might want to have a read write lock on it also if you think that if you don't want anyone else to access it while you're while you're uh, while it's be while while the system is is running so it depends on what type of transaction you want but th you're getting at the, the issue that i think you're getting at is you know, if you have these different types of locking schemes and if to, you have to go out and, and, you know, grab locks on everything to do the kinds of things that we've seen you, you sometimes need to do, then you get into performance issues, right? So what happens when one of these goes down and you're trying to do an update? Well, it has to be available, right? Because if it, this goes down, you do the update to everything that's here and then you come back, this one can have the old version. So now this is, so now we have a consistency issue if something goes down, we have to solve that issue. The other thing is, the, the worst issue is actually what happens if the network gets partitioned? What do we do in that case? What do these guys do? What are these, do they all just kind of wait around and sit around or do they, what do we allow things to be updated and how are they merged? So these are the two kinds of issues that we have to solve. And we can do that. We can. There's there's approaches that you can do to solve these, um, and we'll go. We're going to go through a few of them. The thing to keep in mind as you go through them is pay very careful attention and try to understand what the assumptions are behind and what the trade-offs are, because when you design systems that use replication, 
what you need to do is, is, um, is match these different techniques with what you think the assum underlying assumptions or, or system characteristics are going to be. So let's take this, um, let's take this uh, network partition a little bit deeper. It's a, it's a huge issue because you can have links go down. Right. Links can go down because, because, because of congestion. Congestion can happen un, in, at unpredictable times. And when something gets congested, something, even if, if a, uh, a link is down, say, for a few seconds, that could stall. If you're running hundreds of transactions per second on this, or you tr you're trying to, that could, that could stall the pipeline of transactions you know, in a significant way. That's the more serious of, those, of the two issues, the server crash versus the network partition, in part because servers have become more reliable these days. So it's, um, the network partition is, the network hasn't become, in a sense, um, more reliable and less congested. It's just, it's going the other way instead. So there's a couple of options. There's a variety of options, but they generally fall into two categories. One is called an optimistic strategy, and one is called a pessimistic strategy. And the, we decide between them based on how much contention there's going to be for resources, and also how what your model is of how often these network partitions are going to occur and how long they're going to last. You'll see that why as we start getting into them. So in the optimistic approach, the reason it's called optimistic is because you're, the, you're, you're going to assume that what, you, what you're doing, that you can go ahead, when, when network partitions occur, you're going to assume that you can go ahead and try to do as much work as you can. And the, the optimism is that you're going to be connect, when you get connected, it's going to be something, you're going to get connected more quickly, but you're also, the, the, any inconsistencies that arise are going to be minimal. So AFS is an example that uses an optimistic strategy. They're, they're optimistic that when you make a change to a file that's local, that that's not going to cause you know, 50 people out there all of a sudden to have to do a lot of work. So they go ahead and say, well, if you write the file, then I'm going to say, you, you, you know, I'm going to just write it out and let the merges be dealt with later. What's another system that you guys have used that has optimistic? CVS. CVS. Right, CVS is very optimistic. It says, well, you know, if someone else has a copy of this thing and then you do the merge later on, if there's some really bad thing, it tries to merge intelligently, but if some really, if it can't understand how to do it, then a programmer has to deal with it. And in the worst case, you know, two people just wasted a week of their time. So in the optimistic approach for network partition, what you have is you say any, so this is a general approach. Any of these replicas can act on behalf of the whole. And as partitions, um, as, they, uh, as the partitions come, so if you have a partition, then this one here can act as, as a replica for a set of you know, servers that are doing transactions on this, on this object and the same over here. When the partition, uh, network partition dissolves, so you get connectivity again, then what you do is you attempt the merge. So you take whatever objects were, were over here and whatever objects are over here, and you try to merge them. Now, if different objects were modified here as were modified here, do you have any issues? Hopefully not. Hopefully not. I mean, you just you know they're different, so they're, you just take what was modified here, write it over here, take what was modified here, write it over there, and you're done. So that's case number one. Case number two, there's a merge. But it's something where that you can solve, where you can actually do, use a machine algorithm to do the, the, the merge itself. What's an example of that where you can, the machine can actually decide one thing or the other in a system that you've seen before? Right. So there's time stamping. Um, one of the, if you have a time stamp and you just use that as the order, the latest time stamp al is always the one that, then you can use that as a way to merge. Um, imagine in something like DNS, you could always have a decision that if you get two inconsistent updates, you might say, well, I want to make the system consistent, so I'm going to pick one. Right. That's something that you could do as a, as a fallback. Case, uh, yes. Right. Is that just not considered an issue? With timestamps? Yeah. Well, the Lamport clocks allowed you, they imposed a total ordering because you, if you had if the times, you used both a timestamp plus a process ID. So as long as the, as the processes were totally ordered, then 
in essence, the process ID gives you a coarse-grained ordering, and the timestamps can give you a more fine-grained ordering. And depending on the on the inaccuracy of the clocks, you know, you might have you might have some situations where some things, um, uh, or you you do have skew, but you still have you can still do an ordering. Mm -hmm. um, when you say merge, um, the timestamp thing to me isn't what I understand by merge, where <coughs> You're not making any attempt necessarily to combine the contents of the two files. You've simply got a, a decider for which is the valid and which is the invalid current version. Right. And you just write over the invalid one. Right. Well, it is a form of merging in the sense that the, in the in one case a merge can be like say you're trying to merge say someone blew away a file and someone kept it around that merge would be well you know, let's keep the file around just in case, you know, if, if it's source code. So it's a, it's a more absolute form of a merge. The, when it gets tricky is the third case, which is, which is what happens when the merge requires something that a machine can't figure out without being AI complete. And so the, the example of that is, is something like code. You know, you, over here someone grabs a source file, over here someone grabs a source file. I mean, that's the best example. They both modify them all week and then they come back and they're like, okay, let's put them together and they look completely different. Computer, because it can't, number one, it can't solve the, the halting problem. Um, and number two, it does, has no idea what this, the intent of this program is. It's gonna have a very hard time um, merging those two pieces of code together. Uh, Another example of that, which, which we've seen, is the bank account example, right? If, these, if, the trans, if we have two different bank balances at the end of this, which one do you pick? Um, <laughs> I know which ones I would want to pick, if I, but if I were the bank, I'd pick, want to pick the opposite. Um, so the merge there can be more complicated. If you have access to a transaction log, you might be able to sort it all out. But if you don't, I mean, and banks might, might not want to share those transaction logs with each other, then you can get into a, a more difficult situation. Um, so what's an alternative approach? Well, there's just you don't have to the, you don't have to necessarily give up in this case. For example, one thing that you could do is you could say, well, if you know if I if I'm cut in half and there's an inconsistency, then what I do is I'm going to just uh, not commit until I'm until we get we get the the connection back, and then one of us will abort. You know, if there's if two objects two rights are being made to one object. Um, but there's alternative approaches, which is you can actually try to manage the inconsistencies outside of the transaction mechanism. A great example, which we've been talking about before, are ATMs. Remember how these ATMs in California were, they would say, well, if I can't, if I'm partitioned and I can't talk to the, the I can't get the bank, uh, the bank account balance, then I'm just gonna go ahead and give the money away and, and just and commit there. The problem being that you can have an overdraft situation. But these banks realize that well, you can manage that for, uh, to a large degree outside of the transaction system. So even though there was an inconsistency, which was if the, one of the parameters could be the bank balance will never go below zero, right? You can imagine there being some way of adjusting that once you get connected and setting up a flag for you know the someone to come back and suck money out of you. You know, you, you, some of you, I mean, people, these banks will send letters sometimes and say you need to put money immediately. If you have a a, an, a a line of credit, they might just suck money out of that. You might get a phone call. You might get someone knocking on your door eventually, uh, depending on the amount. Fortunately for the banks, those types of situations were very easy to handle. So instead of trying to make this system more complicated and trying to make sure that certain types of consistency guarantees that they wanted were met, they thought they they figured that it's cheaper to do it outside the box. That's the situation though where you, where you can you can actually merge objects themselves, right? Like they, they don't pick one of those objects, one where the you know ten dollar withdrawal was made and one where a five dollar withdrawal was made, they actually can sum them yeah, but in that case, you still you still have the case that there was some 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 condition, some consistency condition that you didn't want violated, which was overdraft of a of an so account. You can, you can like that's sort of a special case, like, right? That that's one case. There's the date book case also, which is a little bit it makes is is a different flavor of it. The date book case. Um, suppose that you get a partition and you're trying to set up a meeting. So this is I think probably would it's probably will feel better for you from that angle. Um, you set up a meeting, and suppose there's a network partition, and you say, well, I can read from over here, and I know that you, 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 and you, according to this replica, are free 
at you know 1 a.m. on Friday, and uh, and so I'm going to go ahead and just commit that, and then when the t when the when the network comes back up, you go over there and you see and you try to replicate that to everybody else. Now if someone else reserved that time over here, then there's a there's this emerge condition that needs to occur, right? So which one do you pick? Well, if you if you uh, <laughs> The machine could just pick one, but you might not be too happy with it. So what could happen in that case is you get some message saying there is a conflict and you have to decide. Or you could go back and the system could say, well, now the way I'm going to resolve the conflict is to try to reschedule this and then send out you new messages and figure out what times actually are available. So in that case, you, you, the way you fix it is by either running another transaction or asking people to, change, to, to decide between what they want and what they don't want. Does that make that makes sense. Thing to take away from this optimistic is you try to do as much, you try to optimistically assume that these merges are going to be handled or when they can't be handled that there's either some way outside to do it or that the expense of doing it is going to be small amortized to the, the performance gain that you get. So an ex uh, a, a more detailed example of this is what's called available copies replication. So in this approach, same kind of setup over here. You have replicas, and you have uh, machines doing transactions. And you start off by assuming that any available replica manager can process a trans can can act as a proxy for the object that you're dealing with. There's some object that these guys might all be dealing with. Um, there might be another set of of ones over here that are dealing with that have some other object. You can have situations where these guys are all responsible for some object. That depends on how you want to lay things out. So the way this works is reads, reads are fine. You can go to one uh, replica and say, I want to read this value. And, and it'll say, great, here it is. And if you want to write this value, the replica is responsible that you're dealing with is going to say, is responsible for making sure that that gets propagated out to the rest of the replicas. Now you have, as we talked about before, you have some locking that you can do. So if you come in here and you say, um, I want a read-write lock on this because I'm going to read the value and then I'm going to add an amount to it and I'm going to change it, this guy will say, great. Now the interesting thing about this algorithm is at this point, this replica doesn't propagate that lock out to anybody else. This is a performance saving step. So it locally just says, okay, the lock's there. So what, what's, what issue do we have to consider now if that's the case? Someone else might do it on another. Yeah. So someone else might, might be over here and say, um, oh, I want that same type of lock over here. And this one will say, sure, and give that until you have a lock on it now. So the question is, so the, there's transactions running here, and there's, there's different, tra now we're in a weird situation, right? There's different transactions with locks and replicas of the same object, but we have to maintain this one object semantics. So how can we get around that? Any ideas? What's that? Two-phase. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> so how would that work? Each of them asks all the others in the network if it's OK to, to, to lock and then overwrite to the others. And if one of them says no, then um, we have some kind of backup. Exactly. Exactly. So this is this is interesting because now we have, in essence, two levels of two-phase commit. We have we can have a bunch of a bunch of transactions that are running up here, who are going off grabbing objects and do it running just like they normally like we saw the last couple of days. But then when they actually want to when these guys want to commit, they'll go and tell for each object that they have a, a lock on that they're updating. They'll go tell the, its corresponding replica commit. So now there has to be now there has to be a two-phase commit protocol down here to ensure atomicity in that update. So this guy is going to go around and ask everyone, "I want to update this this uh, I want to update this object. Vote yes or vote like a two-phase commit. Vote yes or no. What's this guy going to say if he gets something like that? He has two options, right? If he says what can, if he says so if he says no. You can say no. 
process. Good. So he can say no. If he says no, then then this guy this guy wins and his thing proceeds. If he says this, um, if he says um, I'm sorry, if he says this guy says no, then this guy has to abort. If this guy says yes, then at some point this transaction over here can be aborted. Right? Because that's the whole that's the whole idea of the transaction is you can recover from it and roll it back. So why? So but think about the performance cost of this. Where are we getting really nailed? Well, we have two two-phase commits, and so there's all these messages running around, and that's going to limit the amount of transactions we can handle per second. So this is why this is an optimistic strategy, is that if we have, if we have a lot of situations where the same resource here, is, there's a lot of contention for that same object, and lots of people are trying to write it, guess what? There's going to be a lot of aborts happening. And that's bad because the whole reason you replicate it is because you want to improve the, the uh, availability and performance here. However, if it's the case that these updates are going to happen r relatively mutually exclusively just by the nature of the application, then this kind of system will ensure the consistency, will give you better performance because locally you can go and access only one replica and then you take the hit only at the at the end, but you don't have to worry so much about aborting all the time because everyone else wants that same object. Does this make sense so far? That there's two levels of this that we're using two phase commit at two different layers in this in this architecture, and they're both we're using them both for the same reason, which is that we want to make sure that a set of objects or a set of things are are atomized. In this case, it's the rights to the replicas. Yes? Why do we gain performance by doing the check after the work has been done rather than before? After the work has yeah, been done. saying that they don't check uh, until it's time to commit, whereas they could ask each of the replica managers before going in and getting the lock. Okay. And it seems like you still have to check either before or after. Yeah. And that check is going to be the same bandwidth to communicate right. between them. So, so yeah. So let's come up with some situations where this, where it would be horrible to ask up front versus versus later on. So one of them is imagine that your network is not that reliable, and that before you. And so what happens is this becomes a blocking operation right up front. So right up front you're doing reads, and you have to wait for everything before you can do any type of any type of crunching. And the, if you wait till the end, then after you've done all the crunching and you're waiting to commit then at, that's at the point where you take the hit. Now, what that means is that if you're doing, doing a transaction, and so let's augment that situation. You're doing a transaction. Suppose that your transactions, because you have a, some, a more unreliable network, tend to be one, your abort rate tends to be a little bit higher than you'd like. Well, if your abort rate is higher, then, then you'll never have to go and do this two-phase commit down here on this object if you abort the transaction before before you get to the before you before you get to the commit, so in that case, doing that work up front doesn't get you anything either because you're doing a lot of work up front, and if you think there's a reasonable chance of aborting, then you've done that work is wasted. So what you can actually, I mean, you can ima imagine you can model this pretty with a pretty simple um, set of equations, uh, just like we modeled the whole process, the virtual memory in, in, on the on the quiz. You can those parameters like the network unreliability, the frequency. Um, how often you're going to be accessing these, the frequency of, of aborts. You can put all those variables in an equation to help you to help you compute the number that you're at that you want. Which is, is it better for me to do this ahead of time or or not or, or later? And you'll get a, 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 you know you'll get an answer out. You try it and then run some experiments to see if the model corresponds to what what your assumptions were. But you'll get a dynamically changing answer, but you won't have written code to be able to adapt. Um, well, that's the whole. It, that's the thing is that you, you, when you see your answer, you know you can try it. You can try it one way. You can try it the other. Um, if you're, if it's all over, if, if your, if the model is all over the place, then you're, you know, then you have to try some different approach, like maybe a probabilistic uh, approach that lets you that adjusts for the time of day when there might be more congestion or less congestion or more aborts or less aborts. Um, and if if it's important to you, then you can try to push it to that level. Now, one thing that um, one thing, and, and when you read the, the assignment, the, the book tonight, um, that that you should uh, pay attention to is this. One of the assumptions here in the algorithm I presented is that server failures can be detected. 
Because imagine that you're going to this replica here and you're accessing it. This one's coming over here and accessing this one. And then they've both got some kind of, of locks on them. But then this one goes down. And so this one can say, oh, I'm going to do an update. Well, let me look at who's at, who, all my available servers. Oh, OK, boom. You know, here I'm going to go ahead. They all say yes. Um, now, one of the reasons you wouldn't want to wait for everyone to come up is because you don't know if they're, if they're going to come up and then, um, or when they're going to come up, if they're going to come up. So you would put it, that would be a bottleneck. So one of the, one of the ways that you approach that, there's an, there's an algorithm they show in the book, which is it's called validation, in which if you can actually detect these network, these failures, then you can order transactions and decide whether one of these gets precedence over the other. So like with, we did with timestamps, we have, there's a way of ordering uh, using a logic to induce uh, which one gets priority based on when you observe the, the um, failures of the, of the replicas. Yes? So we took away the network partition in this example, is that right? Like well, if this gets partitioned, they can't ask each other permission for a lock. So does that mean that they, they always fail to get it, or does that mean they always get it? They, well, you get the lock locally. So you can always, as long as you're communicating with the, with one replica, you can get that lock locally. It's when the two-phase commit happens that you can have, that, that's when you have to propagate that and do the atomicity. So if you get a network partition then, then you can address it using some of the issues, some of the ways we talked about before. Okay, where you either just do, um, you basically charge. Yeah. Yeah, or you can you can abort if you if you if you want, or you can if you're in, and that's a transaction and you abort, then this guy might go off and try some other way. Um, but that you'll get what this is trying to do. This approach here is it's trying to uh, mitigate the cost of these potential uh, trans, uh, network failures because you're dealing with somebody local. And if that someone local is on your same subnet, then you can do you can carry out a lot of you can uh, you can increase the performance dramatically and then take a hit, you know, at the end when you're actually ready and you're done with everything. Now, another instance where this might be it might be better to take the hit um, later on is imagine if you're uh, if you're in a nested transaction system and you're coming in here and you're trying to grab locks, you know, grab a bunch of locks that are all going to be in the same that are, are replicated all in the same set of servers, right? Then you can, at the end of this whole thing, then only the locks, then you can, pro you can still use one, one, one two-phase commit to update all of those objects at the very end. And you only need to, um, to update the ones that you end up using because if you have some nested ones that abort, then you don't have to deal with those at that point. Okay. So following up on the question about network partitions, the, op the opposite situation is a pessimistic one. The pessimistic one uh, is that you assume that, that, there's, that merging is something really bad. It's, it's either really bad, it's going to happen enough that you don't want to deal with it, and you want to figure out some way that you can um, still have that replication, can still give you some benefit, uh, but you don't want to pay the, the price of, of the merges. So what you do there is um, there's one approach called a quorum approach. And what it says is that if there's a network partition along the way, that there's, the, the partition is going to induce is sub, subsets of this network. And one subset of that network is what is, can act as a proxy for the whole network of these replicas. And that subset is called the quorum. To get a quorum, you have to have, um, so let me write this out here. If you're for for re, the number of people for a read quorum, or for a write quorum actually, has to be greater than half the total replicas. Okay. Now the number that you need for a read quorum has to be greater than the total number of replicas. Total number of replicas minus the number, th this W number. Okay. Now let me put a little more intuition behind this as to why, th why this, why this is important. So, what you want to, wa what you want it to be the case. The goal of these equations are it to be the case that w when you make an update to something and you have a right quorum, 
that anybody else, um, that this, that any other read quorum that you have will be able to detect that right at some point. So there's, there's one other assumption we have to make for that. Is that we can use some kind of timestamps. Some kind of mechanism which could be timestamps to give, give us some total ordering. So imagine that we had a set of, of replicas. What this equation up here says, the W1, is that to get a quorum, you have to have sort of half plus, half plus one at a minimum. So that means that you can't ever write to, to a replica unless you've got half plus one at the minimum of all, all of the replicas willing to be able to commit that write. Now what the read, what, the, what R says is that you, to, in order to uh, be able to, to read a value and say, and successfully know that that's the current value, that you have to have at least, so the total number of replicas, which is this, minus W, so you have to have at least one more than that. So you have to have at least, this is, this many in your quorum. How is that the total number minus W? Uh, it's got to be strictly greater than. So what is, so what the reason, so these equations are set up so that if I, suppose that I had a right quorum over here and I did, and I wrote this, wrote this new value out. These equations are set up so that I can take any other read quorum in here, and there at least one of those replicas is going to have the latest, the latest uh, version of my object, which in this case, and the way you can tell whether it's the latest version is by your total ordering. So the way you read a value is you go to the members of your read quorum, and you ask them all, you know, what's the value? And then when you get back, you order them according to this total ordering, and then you take the whatever one was the most recent update, or however you however you do that ordering, and that's the one that you that's the value you're going to use. So you notice that it's okay in this case if the if the um, if the updates haven't made it all the way across to everybody. So we get some amount we actually get some amount of performance out of that because now our requirement isn't that everybody has to be updated. It's that at least more than half has to have to be updated. So no matter how we choose this, this, uh, this pink region, we're always going to have at least one member of the uh, one replica that's going to have the latest, the most recent value. Yes? I can see that would work if you had a, a write and then a read, but what if you had a write and then a write? So if you had a right and then a right, yeah. so let's say you had two rights. So let's say you had this as one as your first quorum, and you wrote to all of those, and then say you had this over here as your as your second one, and you wrote to all of those. Well, what's going to happen is that these over here are going to have the the of if, of 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 all of, the, of all of these here. These here, uh, actually, all of these here are going to have the um, the most recent value. These are going to have the the, the old, older one of the you know the older version. But when you take a read quorum of these, any read quorum that you take is going to include at least one member of this most recent write. Why are you saying when you take a read quorum? A read so to read so the algorithm to read is you have to get a quorum of replicas to be able to read. But I thought we just had two writes. So how does the read come in? So if you do a read after the two writes, yeah. yeah. If you do the read after it, if you do it in the middle of it. Is that what you're asking? If you no, do, no, oh, okay, no, okay. Sure. But then, how do you ensure that you hit a different subgroup? Because you're sort of you wrote. You yeah, you don't. The the way that you ensure it is because to get a read quorum, you have to have at least the number of replicas that you have to be that you have to read from has to be greater than the total number minus W, okay. which will always include at least so one member. Know, what about the two Ws in a row? How do you how do you ensure you get two different subsets? I thought your explanation just really don't have relied on. You don't have to have two different subsets to get her to do to write. You just have to have one more than the ha than half of the number of replicas. Okay. 
if it's a, if it's an even number, if it's an odd number, then you round up to the. So you always have to have for to write no matter which set of these you pick, it has the the number of those replicas that you write to has to satisfy this condition. Okay. Then I was confused because when you drew it, you drew two different. Right. Yeah, I was do, I was using this as the worst case scenario. Yeah. So in like the worst case, like what's the worst the worst case scenario is that your write that your reads can't be seen by your that the, your writes can't be seen by a read, right? So if we try to come up with something where the if, where the you have a quorum, and I mean that that's what you want to get around is that the is that when you write to a quorum, it has to be the case that when you create a read quorum that at least one member of that read quorum will have the most current value of the whole system. Okay. And, that's, and we're trying to do that by, by th using this condition here combined with this one, using an ordering. Is okay. that? I, I sort of see that. I sort of see okay. like it, you find the inconsistency. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure I see it when you do two writes in a row. What, where are you going to find the inconsistency? Oh, well, when you do two writes in a row, uh -huh. when you do two writes in a row, there's going to, at the end of the second write, there's going to be at least more than half of the replicas are going to have the most current value. And so the idea is they keep propagating. I mean, the idea is to keep propagating that, those values out, but you can't assume, because of network partitions, you can't assume that you're going to be able to do it anytime soon. So you write to one of these, and, and then you, you, know, you do your best, and, but at some point in time, the worst case is you can't get it out, and someone else wants to read it right afterwards. So the guarantee you have to give the reader is that if they have at least this many, that they'll have at least one member who does have the most recent. Okay. So mm -hmm. if there's a partition that persists through your writing and your reading in one place, then you're going to get your right quorum on the bigger side. If it's right in the middle, then you can't do either. Well, well you could never write. That's right. If it's off to one side, then you can write over here in the big half. Right. Half. Yeah. And you, you can read over here, too. Right. And Until one member comes over. But that's, if it's See, that's the interesting piece is that what, in the case that you just said, all you need is one member of this right partition to be available to the other side, and all of a sudden those, those guys can start reading. So that's, that's why you get the, that's where the interesting dynamics come in for performance is that instead of relying on everyone being able to come over, all you need is one. Yes, in, in that case. <coughs> So, for example, if your first write changes a variable like A, and your second mm -hmm. write changes a variable B, and you go into read, it might get the new values for those two different variables from two different places. Yes. Yes. Okay. That's right. So you don't need to be in that little quadrant where it has both. Like you don't need to be able to see one location that has both the new A and the new B. You can take them from, different, can take them from different. Yeah, that's right. This is just this is on a per object basis. So it may be that some objects have more replicas than others, but you, you and they can be very different replicas. And that's right. Does this not mean reads have to become massively more bandwidth consuming because you have to check read from all of these? You have to have you have to be able to yeah, that's right. That's right. That's absolutely right. So one of the ways you actually that's a great he it's a great lead in guy here. <laughs> so one of the ways that you address that is um is you actually ha can do can put weights on these on these different uh on these different machines, and the way that you, the way that you assign these weights has to do with, for example, how close they are to you, how what kinds of reliability characteristics you have, and the there's a, a paper that came out of um, Xerox Park by Dave Gifford when he was there. Dave is now a, a professor at MIT, where he goes through and exp and gives proofs for why this why how the weighting system uh, will work. Um, Dave was actually Dave Gifford was actually at Park when all this stuff was going like, like the grapevine and, and sort of the, the heyday. Uh, so if you ever get a chance to talk to him about that, um, I'm sure you'd get, uh, you'd get some interesting stories. Okay, so this is pessimistic because, again, just going back to optimistic versus pessimistic, this is pessimistic because if you're, if you have to be in some, in some kind of uh, state where you can guarantee consistency, and if, if like we said over, uh, was mentioned over here, if you don't have a read quorum, then you just, you're stopped, you're blocked, you're not going anywhere. So there's, you can imagine there's a variety of these types of algorithms. Um, another one which, which you can read about in the book is combining these two into what's called a virtual partition uh, algorithm. Now, what you do there is you use, you use the locality. This algorithm, this one over here, this optimistic one, you have 
you can, in a local subsystem that, it, that these conditions, uh, the assumptions here are better satisfied, whereas more, more, in a more distributed way, these are satisfied. You can combine both of them and, in essence, create virtual partitions. So you can say um, a transaction is going to act in a artificially created virtual transition that actually assumes, that actually has quorums in it. Now this is going to work if you have weighted, if you can use weights for the different, um, for the different servers so that you can actually go and, and work with a subset of these. You don't have to go out there and, and, and uh, read all these different ones that have one vote. Now some of them can have 10 votes, some of them, so they have this weighted algorithm. And if you combine those two approaches, then you can get the benefits of the pessimistic um, con uh, consistency uh, guarantees combined with sort of the optimistic uh, performance gains. All right, so putting it all together, you guys have learned a lot of different ways of, um, a lot of different techniques. Uh, about, you've learned about um, transactions and locks and, and replication. So how does this all fit together in a system? Well, transactions, you remember, were we got, we got transactions by being able to implement atomicity and, re and recoverability, or being able to roll back. Okay, those are the two main things. If you have those, great. You can implement transactions. And in fact, that what you could, using this, using what you've learned, I think it would be pretty straightforward for most of you to go actually and implement uh, a transaction system in Scheme or in Java that would that would have real safety guarantees. The reason you can do that is because you can get, um, for example, atomicity using locks, and you know how to do locks because there's different ways you've learned how to do mutual exclusion. In fact, if you want to really push it, you can, do, you can try these consensus type algorithms, but that's something that, that we've learned how to do. We can do atom, atomic writes, which help with recoverability, using logging, like we talked about before on the board, about how you can make sure that writes, especially longer ones, either are all or nothing. So that's, so you can actually, once you implement that, then the question becomes, well, how do you get, how do you push the performance envelope on it? And so we've learned of a couple ways to do it. Distribution is one, and replication uh, is another. So you can distribute transactions, you can do nested transactions, and we talked about the semantics there. And then replication is what we talked about today, is what do you, how, do you ex how do you replicate the data around so that you can have better access to it? That, the bottom piece there, this first part here, I, I'm pretty sure you guys could just you know, implement a, a pretty generic, pretty basic, safe transaction system you know, within a day. No problem with what you've learned. The, the, whenever you're doing this in real life, it's the piece down here, the performance and availability, that nails you each time. Um, I had a friend who uh, worked at Oracle, and he said that they have, I mean, these guys get down to the nitty gritty assembly language level to code some of the bottlenecks and to deal with some of the performance issues uh, because that's, that's the best way to deal with them, which is really nasty because you're breaking, you don't have all these nice abstractions to be on top of, but that's what ends up working for them. Um, if you want to start doing distribution, like anyone who gives you, distribution you know is really hard. When someone gives you a, syst a transaction system and says this is a, you know, the fancy distributed transaction system, what you've learned is that that what are some of the issues in distribution where there's all this about consistency, about failure control, that's how you would go and critically analyze a transaction system. Uh, one angle. The other one is replication, optimistic, pessimistic. What does that imply about uh, the performance? You've also learned that, that when you're thinking about the performance, anything, when it's, as soon as you put the network in for the transaction system, that tends to become one of the key bottlenecks. So you have to start thinking about round trip times and how that's going to affect things. Um, that's one of the, the, the hints of where you should look to first. And the bottom line here is that the implementations can come in many, in many flavors. One of the approaches that I recommend is what we, di what we talked about up here is just if you don't know which approach to use, come up with a model. It can be a simple model like we did on the, on the test. To figure and, and write down what the key parameters are that you're, that characterize your model, and then figure out what the rate of what the, what's the bottleneck in that of how many transactions per second you're going to be able to do, given your assumptions, and that's going to help you differentiate between the different models. So, with that, are you guys going to go all implement this stuff? <laughs> you can. <laughs>
You can. I have no doubt that all, each of you can do it. If you've written this Nutella client, I'm sure each of you can do it. Some of you have actually done it, right? Oh, it, yeah. In uh, in Atlantic City? No. Or, or Vegas. Is Vegas. Is Vegas. Um, the thing that I was talking about yesterday with the two logs, and uh, this actually has great applications in gambling. Um, Greg, is Greg? Is Greg here? The ga okay. <laughs> I picked on him about gambling before. Um, this, this, just one last closing remark about this. Um, transactions are a huge part of um, the next course. Uh, the, the database backed websites, databases use transactions extensively. Um, and it's, you're also going to have a database course itself, and they're probably going to go through a lot of flavors. So if you have any questions about this, please you know, ask me about them, and I can either, if I don't know the answer, I can guide you to some place where, where the answer is, or I can give you some ideas about um, you know, how you might think about transactions in different types of databases. Any questions? Great.